Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Monday, February 4th, 2019. On today's episode, we're going to discuss what we've been up to at the water cooler. The Slash Film Editor-in-Chief, Peter Soretta, and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Managing Editor, Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. Weekend Editor, Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. Senior Writer, Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And Writer, Shui Tren Bui. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hello. So you guys are back from Sundance. We have a water cooler with the whole team again. Uh, last night was the Super Bowl. I did not watch it uh, because that is better for my uh, mel- mental health because I, I just don't like sports at all. But uh, who here did? Well, me, Brad, and HT were all on duty to uh, write up all the breaking trailers. And oh boy, Peter, that was the worst game of football I've ever seen. It's just straight up like... I can't. I've watched the Super Bowl for years out of habit for the most part because football really isn't my jam. I tend to enjoy it for like the social atmosphere surrounding it. But I've never been more bored by a sporting event in my life. And I've been to my fair share of high school football games. Oof, what a nightmare of a game. Just hard to watch. And, and you're in Texas where like you have to like football, right? Yeah, it's kind of. It's. It's. Down here, you have to kind of like football. You have to kind of like barbecue. You have to kind of like country music. And even if you say you hate it, part of you is will at least be knowledgeable about it and know when it's good and know when it's bad. And this was bad at football. Brad, did you enjoy the game? No, not in the least. <laughs> this game, this game was really boring. I, uh, I actually don't care much about football, but usually I, I can get into the Super Bowl and uh, you know cheer whichever team I I uh, pick. And I was rooting for the Rams, and the game was just boring. You know, it's sure, like you know, you could argue that the it's because the teams were evenly matched, uh, and they're they're both strong offensively, and they they were just both you know stopping each other from scoring, so it made for a boring game. But it was just I don't know, I just I really didn't like any of it all. I was just extremely disappointed in it all. HT, are you a football fan? I couldn't care less about football. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching because I had I was invited to a simple party with my friends and we mostly just hung out and had snacks. Last year I had a Super Bowl party where we just exclusively paid attention to the commercials and yeah. not the game. So <laughs> that, that's showing you how how interested I am in this game. So I had no stake in it whatsoever. <laughs> See, in previous years, I would DVR the Super Bowl, and then after, like, you know, when it was get- coming to a close, I would just fast forward through all the football and watch all the commercials. But I feel like in recent years, the commercials aren't even worth watching, so I just catch the good trailers when they hit hit the web. Uh, uh, Chris, were you watching it all? Oh, no. Heavens no. I do. I never watch. I don't, I, I don't care. <laughs> Ben, you're a little bit more of a sports fan than everybody here, right? Yeah, and actually last year I had to cover the Super Bowl for the site, so I didn't really get a chance to watch the game. And this time I like settled in and I was actually excited about watching the game. And like everybody has already said, it was just so boring because it was so low scoring. <laughs> and I don't care about – I mean, even though I live in Los Angeles, I don't have – any real affiliation with the Rams or, or affinity for the Rams, I should say. Um, I just care about offense when it comes to football. I want to see, you know, a 200 to, to 220 or something at the final score of a game. I just want to see, you know, offense, 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 touchdowns left and right. And that was not what happened last night. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was interminable, really. Yeah, I'm from Massachusetts, so I grew up with uh, with obnoxious sports fans surrounding me so i i and i i actually kind of loved the boston teams when they were kind of like the lovable losers who could never win uh and now that they win all the time it just, I, I i almost hope for their downfall and it never happens it's it's very uh, it's it's sad um sad time but let's talk about the trailers really quick uh we we saw our first look i i wouldn't call these trailers i guess tv spots for scary stories to tell in the dark this is the Guillermo del Toro uh, produced adaptation of the the classic children's horror collection. I know, Chris, you were super excited for this film. What did you think? I, I really don't know. I uh, I feel like I'm I'm too biased here because those books were a huge part of my childhood. Just reading those books and you know looking at those terrifying, weird, drippy drawings that they had were just a, a huge influence on me growing up. So I'm very suspicious of any film that tries to capture that. And I want to say this looks okay. It certainly does not look kid-friendly, which is what I was expecting. I was expecting something like 
goosebumps and this is obviously not go it's it's going for something much darker than that so that looks promising but i just i I can't figure out how they're fitting like all the stories into the film like they're telling one specific plot and i wish they had done this as like an anthology film like creep show where there's like a bunch of short stories rather than one film but i feel like it's it's just a little too early to tell like based on this i i can't I can't get a grasp on what the movie is going to be. I kind of wish instead of these four 15 second TV spots, they had just released a one minute trailer. I feel like it was so hard to get a sense of what this movie is just from like these short, like, you know, really tiny bites. But the one that got me was the one with the woman looking in the mirror and she has like the zit and it has this like freaky thing that's coming out of the zit. Like, I feel like that that creeped me out a bit. Jacob, did, did any of these excite, excite you? They're too short to really be anything more than an announcement. But I was t- thrilled that <clears throat> at least a few of the creature designs glimpsed in these seconds seem to be drawing very heavily from Stephen uh, Gamble's illustrations. These people, if you've been on Twitter last night, you probably saw some freeze frames of the pale woman or whatever her name is. And it looks very accurate to her design in the books. And it really freaked me out. So I'm very excited to see... Final product, uh, Andre Alvidal, the director, for me, is two for two. His previous two movies, Troll Hunter and uh, The Autopsy of Jane Doe, uh, are, are the first one is extremely fun. The second one is extremely scary. And I think that's a good combination of talent for, for this uh, movie. So this was not a good representation. I think it just exists to let people know this is coming as opposed to really selling a tone. But, you know, I have faith in the team here, and I have faith that they are clearly taking direct inspiration from the story. So fingers crossed. Uh, one of the surprises last night was a trailer for Avengers Endgame. We kind of didn't know that this was going to be dropped. Uh, and not a trailer. I guess it's another TV spot. What was it, like 30 seconds or a minute long? Um, and, uh, I, I mean, coming from this trailer, I, I feel like I get... I feel like a lot of people didn't understand that this was this was gonna there was gonna be a time jump in this next Avengers film, and you can kind of see that here that this is shot like set like you know three or five years later, and uh, I think people didn't realize how much of an effect that that snap w- was gonna be explored in, in this world. Like it's kind of like it almost feels like you know the world of the leftovers that you know people have left us. Uh, Brad, what did you think of this trailer? Yeah, I really liked it. You know, it is it's composed of entirely uh, new footage. There's nothing here that was in the or initial teaser that was released a little while back, uh, and it, like you said, it does give some hints of where we're going to, you know, find the Avengers uh, in this movie. There are shots of uh, New York, like uh, Ellis Island and City Field, where everything is really disheveled. There's tons of abandoned cars. There's a whole bunch of boats that are either docked or have been washed up against uh, Liberty Island. And so, yeah, there, we, it's clear that a large amount of time has passed since the snap has happened and the world is still kind of trying to figure out how to deal with it. And it's, it's especially taken a toll on Steve Rogers, as we see in there. Um, and if you go check out our trailer breakdown, it seems like there are some hints of how and maybe when things are going to, to happen. Uh, Tony Stark's doing something on uh, the Guardian ship, the Benatar, with Nebula, maybe as an effort to get him back to Earth. Um, there's some hints of things that may uh, where the Avengers, or at least the surviving members of the Avengers, may go following the snap. Uh, a couple shots of Rocket Raccoon and Thor seem to show them possibly where Thanos may have headed after the snap. So there's there's some interesting details to behold here. And one thing that uh, fans have latched onto is there's a particular shot where it seems like maybe Marvel did the same kind of sneaky uh, digital erasure of a character that they did in Captain America Civil War. Uh, For those who remember the trailers for Captain America Civil War, uh, Spider-Man was famously not in any of the airport shots where both sides of the fight were running towards each other, even though he was an integral part of that fight. And there's one particular shot in this new Super Bowl spot where uh, there's Steve Rogers... Uh, Natasha Romanoff, Bruce Banner, and James Rhodes standing in the middle of the like the front yard, or whatever, of Avengers headquarters, looking up into the night sky. And there's a, a an oddly placed empty space between two of them. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's somebody erased there, whether it's uh, presumably Hawkeye, since I think they're trying to hold back whether or not he actually gets back together with the Avengers, because I, I doubt that it's Scott Lang, since we already kind of see that he comes and finds the Avengers on his own. 
So they're they're trying to keep somebody or someone's involvement uh, secret from from that shot. I think. Yeah, and there's a lot more. You did a whole trailer breakdown of this on the site. I'll link it in the show notes. There's a lot more. I love uh, my, my friend John Armstrong pointed out that Steve Rogers is uh, taking uh, Falcon's group meeting, the group meetings that he mentions in uh, what Winter Soldier, I guess. So he's taking over for Falcon there in that group meeting, which is kind of a, I, I think adds a little extra emotional uh connection there from the shot as as a whole but um also captain marvel they showed a new trailer for captain marvel uh we got to see jude uh law doing some some action and uh i didn't love the song brad what did you think of this new tv spot uh you know it's a it's a cool tv spot it's your kind of traditional action-packed super bowl spot um there's some cool instances of uh, captain marvel using her cosmic energy abilities that that look um you pretty fantastic, but I think one of the things that I like in as the marketing has continued is kind of it feels like almost like a a jab back at all of the fanboys who are saying, "Oh, Captain Marvel needs to smile more," because we've seen shots of her not really smiling, but having this like almost cocky smirk on her face, which feels just like a real slap in the face to all those assholes who said that she needed to smile more. Because I, I like the idea of her being so confident in her abilities that she just kind of has this knowing smirk, you know, whenever she's about ready to kick somebody's ass or, you know, do something cool. For sure. And let, let's talk about the the spot, I think, that won Super Bowl, and that is Twilight Zone with Jordan Peele. Uh, I, well, first of all, I don't think this, that not only did this win the Super Bowl in terms of movies and television advertising, but I think Jordan Peele himself won the Super Bowl because he had the trailer for us. He had this and we had Toy Story 4. Um, who, who J- Jacob, you are super excited for the Twilight Zone, right? Yeah, the original show is one of the, the building blocks of my entire personality. So any new version is welcome by me. And this is a really effective trailer. It came out just the right time. It worked beautifully in context of Super Bowl where it sort of hijacks the uh, CBS uh, uh, like um, programming and it just it is empty, uh, st- um, empty football stadium, and Jordan Peele's walking through it. At first, I didn't even recognize his voice. I was wondering, what is this? Then Jordan Peele steps into focus. He realizes the Twilight Zone, and man, it's there's not, not even any footage from the show in here, but it's so evocative and so cool and so confident in the tone it's selling that, like I said, we'll see how the show itself turns out. But man, this is one hell of a way to sell people to sell it tens of millions of people who, who are don't follow movie and tv news to know that there's a new twilight on the way and jordan peele's making it and there was a season three trailer for the ha- handmaid's tale hd i know you're a big fan of the show what did you think of that yeah the second season was a bit of a letdown for me but i'm intrigued to see where they take the third season especially since it seems to, to suggest that um elizabeth Elizabeth Moss's character, uh, June slash Alfred, is starting some sort of revolution, potentially. I mean, who knows if that'll actually happen, but um, from what we see in the trailer, which has sort of more subliminal, like, propaganda-esque imagery, then that is uh, countered with kind of this fiery, raining hell type of imagery from June, we can possibly see um, a big change coming to Gilead. But who knows, because there's a lot of spinning the wheels in the second season that was a little bit um, frustrating. But hopefully this uh, this promising trailer will – it bodes for something different. Yeah. Um, and lastly, after the Super Bowl ended, they did a, a TV spot, a teaser, I guess, for Toy Story 4. This one showed how Buzz Lightyear meets the, t- the two new characters played by Peel and Arkeen Peel. Uh, I, I know, you know what? I, I have not liked the, the first two teasers for Toy Story 4. This one still left me with, like, you know, why is this movie being made? But it, it looked better than those. Chris, I know you are left upset by this by this latest piece of marketing i just i I don't think anything about this looks good and i just feel like part three ended the whole franchise on such a high note such a big emotional send-off this just feels like a cash grab to me like all right we're doing another one i just but chris they're at a carnival it's fun all right i guess (laughs) no it's just nothing about this so far looks good to me i didn't like that teaser spe- specifically was just very lame. It was just like, all right, what do- I don't I don't care about this at all. So I don't know. I'm I'm willing to be you know corrected when the film comes out, but as of now, I am not excited. 
Cool. Um, one thing I was surprised last night, there wasn't anything really huge from Netflix. Netflix last year dropped that trailer for the Cloverfield Paradox and then released it immediately. Was it immediately or was it after the game? After the game. After the game. Um, I feel like they should have taken that on as like a new tradition. that Every year Netflix surprises us with something we didn't know was coming and releases it that night. Uh, but maybe they just didn't have anything uh, to, to give us. But um, okay, l- let's start talking about uh, – let's go into the normal water cooler. Let's talk about what we've been doing. Uh, l- last week I posted – a um a video of me doing a magic trick on my Instagram it got a lot of great response but there was my christmas tree still up in the background i got a lot of crap guys for people say, like saying that you know i should take the christmas tree down i don't As understand you should this. have though peter you, should, you deserved every ounce of that crap and your christmas tree is still up in january <laughs> listen listen uh well first of all it, it was still up in february too but um <laughs> It makes me happy. Christmas time makes me happy. Like, why do people, like, want to just jump on other people for what makes them happy? I don't I don't get it. I'll answer this one, Peter. It's because Christmas is magical because it's a limited amount of time. When you spread it out, you dilute the magic. You're diluting magic, Peter. Shame on you. Okay, Peter, well... I think if you want to celebrate Christmas all year long, you should. <laughs> Christmas is great. That's why I like UHD. That's why. Thanks. Um, I well, t- t- Jacob won. I on Sunday night. I, t- I I took down the tree. It took me a half a day to take down everything, which is why it probably it wasn't that I wanted to prolong the Christmas experience. It was just my laziness and not wanting to do the work. But uh, so Christmas is finally over uh, in my household. Um, Jacob, what have you been doing? Uh, for those of you who follow my uh, puny little Instagram, I'm experimenting with technical paints and like dry paints uh, on my miniature painting. Uh, that means using a subject, uh, a mixture called lathium medium, I believe it's called. I'm going to get a lot of names wrong. Sorry, guys. To uh, thin my paint instead of water, which causes them to last longer so they don't dry out on my uh, when I'm trying to paint. And that's been interesting. I've been using dry paints that uh, go on bright orange but dry to look like rust. So some figures who might look like battle-torn or they've been through hell now have a rust effect on their armor. And also I found a subject – a not subject. I keep saying subject, Peter. I don't know why. A <laughs> uh, mixture called typhus corrosion, which is this very thick, oily, gross stuff. It actually has flecks of stuff in it. I actually spread them out and take a close look at it. And it's meant to look like – uh, oil or uh, dirt or a mach- machine byproduct and putting it on a uh, figure in the right way just looks like machine filth. And I posted some pictures on my Instagram. It's Jacob Samuel Hall if you want to see how that turned out on a batch of Chaos Space Marines, Warhammer 40k figures. And they look appropriately grotesque. Uh, I mean, I have used other oils and shade paints to create you know effects before. But I was never happy with how shiny and new my uh, Chaos Space Marines look when it's supposed to be demonic, possessed, demon worshipping, evil space uh, warriors. So now they look like they've been living in a very bad place for a very long time, and I'm very happy with it. And the more I learn about painting, the more I learn that I need to buy lots more paints and all kinds of technical weirdness to achieve the effects I want. So you win Games Workshop. You have all my money. It is a whole of money. I wanted to ask you, Jacob. Um, you know, when I was in the painting hobby and it was for a short period of time and I was painting mostly Star Wars miniatures. So I felt like I was, you know, when I was painting a stormtrooper, I was replicating the look of the stormtrooper. It, I don't want to say it was like a paint by numbers because it was, you know, no one was telling me what colors to put where and how to do it, but I was, it was kind of an adaptation. So you were creating these uh, miniatures, but I guess the, the, they probably have illustrations of these or do you feel it is kind of like that, like that, that kind of process. Or do you think? Are, are you getting more creative with it? It's a combination of the two. I mean, uh, the, the the manuals and codexes for Warhammer encourage you to be creative. There's always a section for each uh, army in each book. Uh, so, like, here's a gallery, like a massive gallery of photography of like professionally done miniatures. And you browse through, and you realize like, oh, they're using different colors, different color schemes, all different kinds of designs and ideas. So I am sort of taking a cue from those. Uh, like for example, uh, I painted a group, an army group called Astra Militarum, who are supposed to look like you know pretty regular soldiers, you know, you know khaki and gray, uh, khaki gray green color scheme. 
So I really, really borrowed that for the most part, just because it looked good already. Uh, but I'm also experimenting with different things. I'm trying out different colors to highlight different areas, trying to give people different personalities. Like there are certain characters that don't wear helmets, so I'm experimenting with painting faces and different using different um, hair colors, different types of shading oils on those hair colors that make them subtly different from one another. So it's a combination of me trying to honor what they should look like with me trying to make sure they're unique to me. Very cool. I, I do think there's something so therapeutic about painting miniatures. It's almost I feel like some people get this from like putting together Lego. Uh, creations like I know the South Park creators do that like they love putting together like Lego model kits and I feel like y you kind of get the same thing like it's just uh, a relaxing experience um, okay uh, you know this week I got to see free solo in the theaters uh, you know sitting in my own seat but HD took it to the extreme and she actually went rock climbing <sighs> Well, I don't know if it's the extreme because it was an indoor rock climbing gym, um, but I've always really enjoyed rock climbing. I've been on and off uh, since going to rock climb since I was around like 11 or 12. And I went to the camp that took us outdoor rock climbing. But uh, indoor rock climbing is kind of a different beast. Uh, you go and you, there are like different trails and stuff that you do and kind of different problems or puzzles that you kind of have to solve. And it's really fun, um, but it's an expensive hobby. So I've only gone a couple times in the past, like a couple, few years with um, my cousins and my sister who all really love to rock climb and they have like all their own gear and stuff and they're very professional and, and, and everything, but I've never really had the time or money to kind of um, do it regularly. But I'm hoping to start doing it regularly uh, now that I've discovered that uh, an indoor rock climbing gym is available on ClassPass, which is the... Um, the service, like the gym sort of and class service that I've been using uh, more recently for like yoga and everything like that. But they have ballet a dancing. Pass. I'm sorry? Ballet dancing. Yes, and ballet dancing. And um, they uh, there was a day pass for this gym, this uh, rock climbing gym called Brooklyn Boulders on class pass. And uh, so my friends and I decided to go and uh, we had a lot of fun. I'm I'm hoping to do it more regularly um, and just kind of start climbing uh, more often, especially in the winter when there isn't lots of things to do outdoors. Uh, indoor rock climbing is great. And um, my friend, my cousins who have all like started rock climbing regularly said that there's like a great community there too. So I'm hoping to like maybe meet more people and become and make new friends. I don't know. So I, I like rock climbing a lot and I'm hoping to, to do it more often. And I will, I will say that I successfully am <laughs> sore all over and my hands will probably start callousing soon, so that'll be lots of fun. So, so next year you're going to attempt your first free solo, right? Oh, obviously. No. <laughs> I, I, I do have to ask. Um, you know, square footage is a premium in New York City. I guess this mm -hmm. is in Brooklyn too. It's still a premium, not as big of a premium in Manhattan. But uh, how is an indoor rock climbing place? different in new york new york than it is like you know maybe where you had previously gone in the suburbs it's actually not that different um because uh there are only a few mm, it depends on the gym uh in the suburbs you pro you can have like a lot of space but uh usually all you need is like one big kind of warehouse looking space and you can have like several walls uh some are that some that are meant for top roping which is the kind that you have with a, a harness and that you climb with a rope and others that you use for bouldering which are much shorter walls but you don't climb with a rope and that one is the one i've been doing because then i don't have to rent a harness or anything and um it's it sounds intimidating because you know you do fall but uh they have like these giant crash pads and it's a very <laughs> short um distance from the top of the wall to the bottom. So um, I recommend, actually, if you want to try rock climbing, to try bouldering because it is the more inexpensive version where you don't have to, like, get someone to belay you, which is the person who, um, you know, holds and yeah. holds the robe and everything. So um, what was I saying? Um, yeah, I don't know. It seems fairly large, the Brooklyn boulders that I was at. So I would say that it... They don't seem to want for space. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, ben, it sounds like you caught the Sundance flu. 
I did. That's all I have to say. That's all I've been doing over the past few days is just trying to recover because I got I left Park City on I don't even remember what day it was at this point. Uh, Tuesday, I guess. And I didn't actually get sick until I think it was Thursday. And that is generally what happens to me. It's like, you know, the the plane or like that last bus ride. Somebody probably coughed on me or something. And it takes a couple days to kick in. But I for a brief period there, a brief window, I thought that I escaped Sundance without catching the dreaded Sundance sickness but uh, it turns out as you can probably hear in my voice that I, I managed to catch a cold so uh, great stuff and I, I, uh, Chris I think you were sick too right are you over it uh, I still have a little bit of it and unfortunately I think I got my wife sick because she woke up today and she was like oh my throat hurts and I was oh, like, sorry no. I, I brought the Sundance sickness back with me uh. it's like that movie Contagion <laughs> <laughs> yes, somebody needs to kill Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah, and cut that. her head open. <laughs> Brad, um, you, you somehow escaped this flu? I did. I don't know how. I, I normally do end up getting sick after Sundance or even during, but this time I, I did not get uh, stricken with it, so I'm I'm thankful. Well, very cool. Um, okay, let's move on to what we've been reading. Uh, this week I received this book in the mail. It's a magic book called Magic for Young Lovers by Andy Jerksman. Uh, the title is kind of a joke. Uh, it's not really for young lovers. Uh, Andy Jerksman runs this website called The Jerks, which is kind of... Um, it's a fringe magic website that's basically established itself as being against the establishment of the magic community, but he's also very smart, and this book is uh, filled with clever uh, insight and um, uh, magic theory. Uh, it's not something I think anybody out here will buy because this is a book that costs in the three figures uh it's, it's that kind of thing when when, when when you're dealing with magic secrets things get pricey uh but the, the interesting thing about this book and i wanted to bring up here is it's all about how andy believes that magic effects uh that made that can make the uh, magic effects that he's done in his past that have made lasting memories in people that he's performed to um have never all never been the most strongest effects or most visual effects or the most surprising effects. He says the tricks that stayed with people were the ones with an interactive present tense narrative that engaged them emotionally. So uh, I've been sitting around thinking a lot about how I could do that with my magic. And I, th I thought that was kind of interesting that uh, people want magic that can, make them feel like they're part of it and in the moment and it tells a story that is not uh you know being presented by you but is happening in real time um which is kind of cool uh jacob what have you been reading unfortunately nothing serious my reading's been really thrown off these past few weeks i'm hoping to get back into some proper reporting uh on what i'm doing very very soon but i've been skimming through uh, a book i've read uh years ago the new edition i found in a bookstore and i picked it up this is uh, Sigology by the film writer Vern, just goes by Vern, and he's been around for a long time. Uh, he, and he's specialized in writing about action movies and B-movies and uh, lending a lot of critical thought to stuff that normally doesn't receive it. And this book is entirely about the career and films of Steven Seagal, and it's, it's a fascinating thing because he spends way too much time, way too much effort, and way too much thought on Steven Seagal movies. And... and the new edition has pretty much doubled in length from the first edition because it includes all this directed video junk and crap he's made in the past decade. And flipping through it and just picking a chapter and, and reading it is fascinating because he's giving the time of day to some real garbage crap and trying to understand how it fits in the larger filmography of Steven Seagal, who's a nightmare of a human being, as anybody who follows the news may know. So if you're a fan of, like, really good film writing about really specific subjects. This book and its, and its new edition is very much the definitive guide to an actor who really does not deserve as much attention, but ends up being kind of fascinating because it exists. And I really recommend it. It's a really, really fun, bizarre read. Yes. Uh, I think we fe featured this on the site in the past. This is a book from a few years ago, right? Uh, yeah. The, the newer edition, like I said, updates yeah. it. So that's, that's the one yeah. to get. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's move on to what we've been watching. I, uh, 
you know, just uh, a warning. I watched a lot of stuff this week, so I apologize in advance, but I'm going to be talking about all of it. Uh, let's first talk with Russian Doll. This is a new Netflix TV series. This was on our most anticipated uh, TV shows of 2019 list. Uh, this is a show starring Natasha Lyonne, uh, who is celebrating her. It, she plays a character who is celebrating her 36th birthday. And she is at a party thrown by friends, and she keeps on getting killed and reliving the same day over and over again, Groundhog Day style kind of. Uh, the series features episodes directed by Leslie Headland, who directed uh, The Bachelorette, which I did not like, and Sleeping with Other People, which I did like. Jamie Babbitt, uh, who directed But I'm a Cheerleader and a ton of TV shows like Girls. And Leon herself, who created the show alongside, alongside Headland and uh, Amy Poehler. Uh, like I really like this show, guys. Uh, it, it's um, you know if you like this time loop premise, I would say actually I would say everybody here should watch the show, like with with, with no uh, stipulations. But uh, it's fun. Admittedly, she she dies like super easy. It's not like final destination where death is following her, and but she's finding herself in comically funny accidental deaths and. Um, this, this show's really good at establishing a formula for this world and then finding ways to play with that the rules that were created in interesting ways. And um, while the show isn't necessarily about this, I love how you get to find out who the characters are and how they connect in an interesting way and explore different paths and, and the possible outcomes. In a way, for me, it's, be- it's a better version of Bandersnatch the Black Mirror movie that was released by Netflix. That was uh, a choose your own adventure because, uh, you know, it's not interactive, but you get to explore all these different paths. And funnily enough, the main character of the series is a video game programmer. Um, it has some really interesting twists, which I don't want to ruin here. Uh, you know, the show is 30 minutes or less and is insanely bingeable. There's four hours of content here. I, I watched it in one night alongside Velvet uh, Buzzsaw. So I, I think that's probably the way to do it. It's very enjoyable. Uh, quick binge. Uh, Chris, you also watched this. What did you think? Yeah, I loved it. It's it's one of those rare Netflix shows that doesn't overstay its welcome. Um, for one thing, the episodes are only about like 24 minutes each. So it, it never... It never has that problem that a lot of Netflix shows have where it feels like there's too many episodes and they should have whittled it down. I actually would have liked even more of this, but I think it has just the right amount of episodes. And it's really clever and it's really funny. And uh, Natasha Leone is phenomenal in this. Uh, I'm so glad she has like this showcase for, you know, how talented she is. And, you know, I, I hope like... I don't want to see a second season of this necessarily because I feel like it wraps everything up, but I hope she keeps doing more things with Netflix like this. I hope they, they just sign her to do more stuff because it's clear she has a lot of really good ideas that are just, you know, waiting for someone to pick them up. Yeah. And I feel like this is so good and people are watching this judging by my Twitter timeline that Netflix is going to want to do a second season, but I don't even know what that would look like, which is uh, interesting. Um, but I followed this up on Friday night watching Velvet Buzzsaw. This is a film that premiered at Sundance and was on our most anticipated films of the year. This is uh, the third film from Dan Gilroy, the director of Nightcrawler. Um, it is about a series of paintings by an unknown artist who are discovered in a supernatural force and acts revenge on those who have allowed their greed to get in the way of art. Um, it, uh, you know, this had very divisive reaction at Sundance. Uh, Chris, I know you liked it. I, I don't know what to think of this movie, to be honest with you. Uh, I kind of liked Nightcrawler. Or I loved Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler, I think, was my favorite movie of that year. And what I liked about Nightcrawler was the the somewhat grounded, uh, how it's grounded in this kind of dirty world of news videographers. But this film is very stylized world of quirky characters in the Los Angeles art world. And it feels this movie, you know, it, ha- it has these super stylized, uh, over-the-top theatrical performances that are already pretentious characters and clearly more fantasy than reality. And I know this is a satire. It feels, this film feels kind of like 
one of Nicholas Reffin's follow-ups to Drive. So if, you know, Nightcrawler is uh, is Gilroy's Drive, then this feels like Neon Demon, I guess, by, like, Neon Demon more. Uh, I don't know. It's I feel like this movie... It's, it's hard to tell what this movie wants to be. It, is it an ensemble drama? Is it a satire of the art world? Is it a horror movie? Is it a mystery? It's never quite funny. It's never quite scary. I think my biggest problem with this film is it's just the mismatch and doesn't quite feel consistent. It feels hollow. It lacks the psychology of Nightcrawler. And, uh, you know, Gilroy, like, you could tell he has the talent by watching this, like, it's just cinematically like, you know, how things are shot is, is very interesting. Uh, and I I'm guessing he probably is saying something about the art, world of art criticism and the art world and commercialization, commercialization of art. But for me, it was all too silly to take seriously. My girlfriend Ketra walked out, I think, after 45 minutes and went to bed because she just hated it that much. Uh, ben. You also saw this movie. Did you like it more than me? I think I did like it more than you, uh, but I, I didn't love it. I think I'm I'm really like all in on the performances here. I loved what Jake Gyllenhaal was doing in particular. He delivered so many like uh, incredible little monologue, mini monologues, and like uh, just memorable lines and things that uh, about the profession of criticism that I feel like actually apply to a lot of what we do at Slash Film. Um, you know, he's playing like a very like you said, sort of like over the top, borderline ridiculous character, but he commits so well. Um, and, and I just, I totally bought what he was doing. Uh, I like the look of the movie too, but I think every time a death happens, which is, you know, pretty frequently throughout the film. Um, I, I just felt like those, those moments felt like they were from an entirely different movie. Like I, I wish that it didn't have that, uh, horror angle to it because as just an exploration of, um, you know, of the the art world and all that stuff. I, I'm here for that movie, but as soon as the, you know, the art comes to life and starts killing people, that's where it's sort of, like you were saying, Peter, felt a little disjointed, and I just, I wasn't, uh, I don't know, I wasn't fully on board for that blending of, or for the way that those tones were blended in this particular movie. Yeah. Chris, I know you haven't really gotten a chance to talk about this on the podcast uh, because it was part of your uh, your Sundance viewing. But what did you think? Uh, I really liked it. I, I mean, I, I actually agree with all the criticisms both you and Ben said, but I, I, the movie just worked really well for me because it's it's just really funny. Like, I just laughed my ass off at this movie. And like I, I get the argument that, you know, I've seen a lot of people make this argument that they wish the movie were deeper. But, you know, to me, like, this is a movie about paintings that kill people. And I don't need that to be deep. I just need that to be, <laughs> I just need that to be entertaining. And I was very entertained by this. I think the cast across the board does a, a great job. Um, and like, yeah, I, it, it would be a better movie if, you know, the satire was sharper, if Dan Gilroy, I think, had something real to say here. And I, I actually don't think he has anything serious he's trying to say here. I think he's really just trying to make sort of like a trashy, funny movie about, you know, paintings that kill people. Like there's a scene where a guy gets killed by a bunch of monkeys that come out of a painting and they're like mechanic monkeys because they're working on a car. <laughs> and like to me, like that works. Like if you're going to make a movie where, you know, monkeys come out of a painting and murder someone i'm i'm all in and what i loved about it is like there's no explanation either like there's never a scene where they're like all right here is why the paintings kill people it just it just happens and to me i don't know like i i i was uh i was sold on that but i i can understand people not getting on board with how how goofy this movie is but it worked for me i feel like it was just a little too ridiculous for me but i like i don't know i feel like this this is a gamble. You might love this film, you might hate the film, but it's it's kind of a dice roll at this point. I think, I I, I think this is not something that everybody's gonna dig for sure. Um, you know, this weekend I got to see a uh, press screening of the Lego Movie Two, the second part. This is the film that I was not really excited to see. Uh, you know, the trailers for this kind of 
made it, it didn't really look like they were that funny. Lord and Miller weren't directing, and the original director of this film, I think, was replaced late into the production. And it kind of seemed like one of those crash grab sequels that was just trying to recapture the magic of the original film. Oh, how wrong I was. Uh, the, the second part is filled with all the humor, heart, and uh, I guess like fourth wall breaking story that I loved in the original. Uh, this film could easily have been that cash grab sequel that I talked about, but it, it makes some very interesting choices and aims f- to be more of like a Toy Story 3 type of follow up. It's, I'm not saying it's as good as Toy Story 3, but it, it's kind of making it, – it's emotional in that way and making some very interesting choices that you wouldn't think from a kid's animated movie. It's uh, it's not typical in animated movies that I am surprised by the second – and thir- the, the later second and third act of the film. But this film had some fun and interesting twists and turns that I think elevated this film a lot for me. I also really dug some of the new songs. There is a credit song from Lonely Island that you should not listen to until you see this on the big screen, which is just uh, fantastic. Um, No one else from the site has seen this yet, right? Uh, Only our freelancer, Josh Spiegel, who is less enthusiastic than you, unfortunately. But it seems like you're really positive about this. I'm surprised. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm not saying it's, like, amazing. It's it's not as awesome as the first, but it, it's it's really good. Jo- Josh just hates everything. <laughs> just, <laughs> um, uh, I, I love Josh's reviews, but he, he, he definitely is way more negative than me on a lot of stuff. Um, I also saw – I got to see Free Solo. This is the documentary that – Ben and I think a couple of other ones of you talked about, but Ben was the first one to see this on this podcast. And this is a film that I was not, uh, it's a film that I didn't really want to see. This, this is a movie that follows a man who becomes the first person to ever free solo climb Yosemite's, uh, 3000 foot tall El Capitan wall, uh, with no ropes or safety gear, and it, it, people are calling it the greatest feat in rock climbing history. Um, I didn't want to see this film because I really think the free soloing is irresponsible and dumb and uh, empowering someone with making a film about them and actually going to see it felt to me like supporting that is something that could actually get him killed and his kill. You know, many people have died from free soloing. Um, but Ben, uh, said, said a lot of great things about this film on the podcast. So I went and saw it and, uh, I really like this film. Uh, the movie does get into the ethical issues of taking on such a task, uh, including as Ben said, the filmmakers who were there shooting it and, you know, could be responsible for, uh, this man pushing himself even like an inch too far and killing himself. Obviously he doesn't kill himself. We know that, you know, that going into the film. So I feel like, uh, you know, a little of that tension is pulled out of it, but um, I I think what I wasn't prepared for in this film was to be so interested in the human at the center of the story. Uh, he's kind of compelling. He is painted almost like Spock, a man without emotion, uh, which is partially why he's able to deal with the fear involved with this hobby, but also something that's prevented him from becoming... Uh, into into a relationship, but he is in this part of this growing relationship. And this growing relationship, I think, is for me the heart of the story. Uh, it's the climb itself is breathtaking, even though we 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 know that he makes it. Uh, I wish we could have got some more dynamic shots of that, but it seems like the filmmakers made the choice to kind of pull back. Uh, for you know, to for reasons to not make him nervous. I think. Uh. I, I traditionally think of hiking and camping as an improv exercise in of adapting to conditions. And it was amazing to see how planned his every move was down to the finger and foot positions, mm-hmm. how far, you know, each inch was away and what kind of moves he would have to make from move to move in the difficult areas. Like he had everything mapped out to like the inch. And that was uh, insane. I, I, I really enjoyed this documentary. 
So uh, yeah, there's there's that one shot of him with a notebook, and he's just writing down like from memory every step that he's going to take throughout this whole thing, which takes him like whatever four hours or something to go from the bottom to the top, and he's just like doing it in his mind, and he knows every tiny you know finger sized foothold and all of that so it's, it's pretty incredible yeah um and that is in theaters now it might even be an imax uh, if you can see it right now i didn't see it in imax so i'm not sure how that translates to the to the huge screen but um i i also saw perfect bid the contestant who won too much on amazon video this is a film that brad saw two weeks ago i think i mentioned on this podcast um this is uh, about a guy who became adept at recording and memorizing the prices of products featured on the show, The Price is Right. Um, and he realized that the products were used multiple times. And if he could remember the prices, he he went to the show and tried to be on the show, I think, like 40 times or something. Uh, he eventually did get, on, get to be on it, but he, he would oftentimes help contestants from the sidelines yelling prices that he knew. And at one point... Uh, helped in uh, one of the biggest controversies in game show history, according to the plot synopsis here. I'm not sure if that's true, but uh, basically someone placed the perfect bid during a 2008 showcase, which stopped the production of the show. Um, the topic is really interesting. The documentary is so poorly produced and probably could have been a better short film. It feels a little disjointed. Uh, it has like interviews with like Bob Barker and the producer of the show, neither of which are saying anything about the stories that are related to this guy. They're just talking about the show and it kind of like seems like two different documentaries, one about the one about the the show and one about the controversy. And um, I feel like I would just want to see one about the controversy. Does that sound about right, Brad? Yeah, I mean, it's but I also do think that some of that stuff helps to provide context yeah. as, and like, and like sets up, you know, why it was such a big deal and like the, the environment of the show. And like, especially when they bring up the idea of like a conspiracy, maybe being the, the force behind, you know, the perfect bid. But I, I totally agree with you. Like it's, it's very poorly produced and it's the subject matter. That's the most interesting. E- even after I said some bad things like that, I think it is worth watching and it's on Amazon prime. So you can watch it if you're an Amazon prime subscriber. Uh, the other thing I watched, uh, and I'm getting to the end of this. So I, I apologize for going on guys, uh, is Narcos Mexico on Netflix. This is the spinoff of the popular Narcos, uh, series on, uh, the streaming platform. This is a show that you don't need to see the other Narcos shows to, to watch. I, had been a fan of the Pablo Escobar seasons of Narcos, and I di- didn't finish the, I think, the third season that went uh, off that track. Uh, this spinoff takes place in Mexico, as the name indicates, and follows the rise of the Guadalajara cartel as uh, an American DEA agent learns the danger of targeting Narcos in Mexico. And uh, that is, it has Michael Pena and uh, Diego Luna. Uh, the show looks and feels like a big budget movie. It's epic in scope. Uh, the original series had a mix of English and subtitles. This show, I think, has even more subtitles. Uh, so you know, take take that for what it's will, what you will. I am really enjoying this series. I've just gotten up to the part where El Chapo enters the mix, and uh, the the this series is just so great at creating uh probably not accurate but dramatic sized moments out of this history of how this whole thing happened and i'm really enjoying it and i would recommend it to everybody i also saw a press screening of alita battle angel um which is another movie i was not expecting to like at all and maybe because i had such low expectations i enjoyed uh, I feel like you could feel James Cameron's fingerprints all over this from uh, the breathtaking world building to the best 3D I've seen in a few years to the painfully nose uh, on the nose dialogue and symbolism. The You know, you get Robert Rodriguez's like trying to be badass action sequences, which sometimes work, sometimes don't. And awful, uh, obviously, he, uh, you know, he has like these flat acting choices that I think he's responsible for. Uh, the male lead is awful and it's painfully obvious he's dressed like Robert Ramirez or Rodriguez. Sorry. I really don't like Christoph Waltz in these kind of big movies in this kind of role and it's not like i don't believe him as a doctor but he has a dual role of sorts in this movie that isn't 
I guess a spoiler, but I feel like I just don't buy him as this. I don't buy him in Ready Player One. You know, he should just go to doing more interesting roles. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'd be interested in seeing more movies in this franchise. It sets it up for sequels, but I don't think people are going to go see this movie. And I was also surprised that there, this movie has, like, a sports subplot. There's, like, this whole thing called Motorball, which is kind of like a cross between Roller Derby and NASCAR or Nintendo's F-Zero, and it's kind of cool. Um, H.T., you watched this film. Uh, what did you think? I quite enjoyed this movie. I had a lot of reservations going in just because of Hollywood's track record with uh, manga and anime adaptations. I feel a lot of it is because anime is just kind of uniquely unsuited to being adapted to live action in the big screen just because everything is so outsized and over the top and heightened. But I think that um, with uh, Alita, this benefited from um, Robert Rodriguez's uh, ability to use like that visual style and kind of and in, in a way that like parallels the di- the dynamism of like anime fight scenes for example and um also that this this um property is not really well known i actually hadn't really heard of it before the uh, movie was announced and i was like oh what is this so i checked it out and it was something that kind of came um about at the tail end of like the cyberpunk phenomenon like in the 90s and even amongst like big anime fans it's not really well known so i think that rodriguez and james cameron had a lot of freedom to kind of do with it as they would and that helped them a lot i think because this is a film that looks really gorgeous and looks really stunning especially the fight scenes are just incredibly breathtaking and um and dazzling so i really enjoyed that and i did not hate the giant eyes either. That was something that um, I think actually kind of worked in favor of the film. Um, In anime, big eyes are kind of uh, a frequent um, sort of common link with anime because they were often used to better express emotions. Like you see with Disney films that their eyes are also very big. With big eyes, you have a greater range of emotions that can be expressed in animation. And uh, that helps it with um, with the, the live action Alita too. Like it kind of is a little bit of a visual gimmick, but it does help with the somewhat more um, emotional scenes, uh, especially with Rosa Salazar. She's she's great in it as well. Um, I actually disagree with you on Christoph Waltz. I really enjoyed him in this just because he seems so like ridiculous with his giant scythe that he carries around. And I, I just don't was... buy him as killing like these monster thing. I don't know. Yeah, I understand that, but at the same time, I feel like it was kind of in tone with the movie and like kind of the heightened. Um, it's like everything about it. So I, I really enjoy that. Like I think him and a lot of the other villains of this film really sold it. Uh, and they kind of knew what kind of movie they were in. Like it was something that was a little bit over the top and a little bit uh, insane. And that's why I think he kind of works in that context. But yeah, I think this is probably the best manga adaptation that's come out of Hollywood yet. And hopefully it will be um, not the last yeah. Um, and you know what? The big eyes didn't bother me either. I just don't know why they even needed to create a CGI head for this. Like, I feel like Rosa Salazar would have been great to just see her with an augmented CG body. But yeah, I think it was un- unnecessary, but it worked, I guess. So I wasn't angry about it, but it was something that I feel like they were just experimenting with. And I'm like, this is fine. Yeah, I, I did have a lot more fun with this movie than I than I thought I was going to. I think people are probably not even going to go see this. So, but uh, but I would recommend it. And it sounds like you would recommend it, right? Yeah, I would recommend this actually. Yeah. Um, okay. Lastly, I saw a documentary called Generation Wealth. This is from Lauren Greenfield, uh, who is the director of one of my favorite documentaries of all time, The Queen of Versailles. Uh, we are quoted on the trailer. Is that Ben that was quoted? Yes. Yes. Ben is quoted on the trailer. I was very excited to see this. This is on Amazon Prime Video now. And this film takes a look at our obsession with wealth and what uh, is doing to us as a culture. And it's told partially through a recall of Greenfield's uh, career, capturing it on film. Uh, It has some interesting insights. uh, But I think what hurts this documentary for me is it goes so wide with this topic that it kind of lacks a concise narrative. 
Um, it's kind of a montage of things and explores the theme uh, through different stories and not really ones that, you know, it follows along too tightly. Uh, the story of Lauren's early career is interesting to me, and but there's only so much you can watch of her and her assistants going through old photos and tacking them on walls. Like, that's not really dramatically interesting for for a film. Um, it eventually does come around to her relationship with her family, her sons, her mom. And I think that's some really good stuff that uh, kind of seems reminiscent for me now of, uh, you know, mining the gap a little bit. Um, it's, uh, I'm not um, sure this doc is like a must see. It, it was enjoyable, but I, 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 I think I loved Queen of Versailles a lot more than, than this one. But you can, you can watch that on Amazon Prime Video now. Jacob. You you actually just read through the manga of uh, Battle Angel, but you have not. Uh, oh, the, the, that was a. Uh, it has not hit theaters yet, right? Uh, no, not yet. I read the first uh, three hardcover volumes, which yeah. is uh, a three of five. So I or I have the fourth one in my possession, but I have not seen the movie yet. The the manga is really good. I, it's a really really strong fun action comic. So. Having read it, uh, I'm actually more impressed by the trailers because they really seem to have nailed the aesthetic that the art yeah. uh, uh, was really, really nailing on the page. Yeah, the world building is pretty cool. Uh, what did you watch this week, Jacob? Uh, not much. I just continued my Game of Thrones rewatch to prepare for the final season. And we hit season five, my wife and I. And, oh, boy, I've forgotten how rough season five is. This is the season where everyone spins their wheels for a while and characters we love are sidelined and Jamie and Braun go to Dorne for the worst subplot in the entire series. It, it's a rough, rough watch compared to the rest of the seasons. I mean, I'll still take it over a lot of television. It's still Game of Thrones. There's still stuff I, I like, but there's more to hate in season five of Game of Thrones than any other season out there. And it's a shame because it follows up season four, which is my favorite season. And it's followed immediately by season six, which is a, a real strong like, instant return to form. But it's not just like the stupid, low budget, tacky stuff like Jamie and Dorn. It's stuff like Sansa getting married to Ramsey Bolton, which is not on paper a bad subplot. I mean, I mean a woman being forced to marry a monster it could be good. But the show treats her abuse as through the eyes of the men around her instead of examining it through her, which is just a bad choice and a sign that Game of Thrones needed more women on staff to really understand how to handle that topic in a way that made sense. I'm not saying like Game of Thrones shouldn't shy away from brutality. I'm saying it should handle it responsibly. And season five is the one season where they really dropped the ball on that. Uh, ben, I think we talked about this before, but do you agree that season five is the worst season? Yeah, by far. Uh, I am also doing a rewatch much slower than you are. I just finished season five, so I have two more seasons to catch up. Um, but uh, but I finished my rewatch of, of that fifth season like two months ago, and I still have like a bad taste in my mouth from that season because all the Dorn stuff, which works so well in the books and is so um, vividly drawn in the books, is ju it just lands with a complete thud. Uh, in the show and then yes everything that you've said about the Sansa character and that plot line in in particular is just like it, it's it's really like the the biggest stain on Game of Thrones the show like on its legacy I think like when you look back at the show as a whole that is by far the worst stretch yeah and it's as you say like the, the Dorn stuff in the books is some of my favorite stuff and by the time they get around to season five the showrunners were very open about how they wanted to start contracting the world instead of expanding it so they give a short shrift to so many characters, and they cut out so many characters who are worthwhile. And, like, Doran Martell, who's barely in the show, and is just this character who's killed off very quickly in Season 6 after doing nothing in Season 5, is maybe one of my favorite characters in the books. So it's just this... It's insulting to viewers and insulting to book readers. It is the only time where I find myself actively fast-forwarding through Game of Thrones. I mean, there's one episode where... I'm going to spoil uh, Episode 4 of Game of Thrones Season 5 right now, guys where Barris and Selmy, the greatest knight in Westerosi history, <laughs> and a group of the Unsullied, the greatest warriors in Essos, are ambushed in an alley by a bunch of rich people wearing robes and golden masks, and the untrained rich people kill the Unsullied and Barris and Selmy in a poorly choreographed fight, because they clearly need Barris to die, but they don't send him out like the way he should. They send him out in a fight where the show is told repeatedly he would have won that fight. It is bonkers insulting I, i'm still angry about it. We, we got that scene my wife and i ended the episode we, we couldn't stand to watch barrison go out like that it was just it's one of the worst decisions i've ever seen in any tv show 
<laughs> yeah, it's 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 the same thing that you were talking about. It's like as long as the I understand the difference between the the books and the show and how they had to make certain choices, especially later in the series, to uh, uh, to make a show work because they have it's a wide a wildly different medium. But at least play by the rules that you have previously set up in the show, like saying that Barristan Selmy is the greatest warrior and then having him go out that way. Um, it is yeah, it's just a slap in the face. In uh, previous weeks, Ben was talking about Police Story one and two on this Water Cooler podcast. Is she? You decided to, to to see these in theaters? Yeah, I actually had planned to see this um, back when Ben was talking about uh, going to see like I, watching the four K resolution, I think. And um, they were doing a marath a double feature of Police Story one and two in that four K restoration at the Alamo Draft House. And I went for my friend's birthday, and it's, it was my first time seeing uh, both of these films. And um, I actually have only seen one uh, like early Jackie Chan film, and that was Drunken Master, which is a movie I really loved. Um, but it was in the English dub, so this is my first time not only seeing an early Jackie Chan film, but also in like the the um, original Chinese language. And oh, these movies are so good. Um, they're brilliantly staged. Uh, th- thrilling, like well-choreographed uh, martial arts films uh, that have both the balance of physical comedy and these just amazing set pieces uh, with Jackie Chan starring and directing in these films. And um, this uh, was, uh, I really liked Police Story 1 a lot. Um, Police Story 2, I think, was a more polished film that didn't quite have the energy of the first, just, uh, despite like you know, having kind of everything going the same. It had a little few more subplots and felt more like a modern blockbuster in a way. But Police Story 1 just has like this sort of scrappy feeling to it in which um, Jackie Chan is just like going, swinging for the swinging for the fences and like everything. And um, I really love to see a lot of the the um, the stunts in which he would just have, you know, the camera steady and like have, walk out the entire thing in one shot and one take. And you can see, for example, the most famous stunt that he did uh, in which he like goes down like this giant pole that has all of this wires and electricity around it. And you can see like right before he jumps that he is like contemplating his life right then and there. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's insane. And it's so, it was so great to see on the big screen. Is, uh, is this the first time you've been to the Alamo draft house? No, I've been a couple times okay. before. Did they do I, anything I thought, special for for this screening? They they didn't, and I was a little disappointed. But um, it was still fun, and um, I went previously for to see the favorite where they did have a themed menu, but they didn't have one for this one. Did did they show anything before? Because I love like in in Austin they'll have like this pre roll of clips and short films and commercials that kind of are usually about like related to the film you're seeing. Do they do that in Brooklyn? Yeah, they had a little job, like Jackie Chan retrospective uh, in the, during the previewing um, sort of montage. And uh, it was clips from his career as well as these random um, sort of intercuts and like segments from, I think like adult swim or, um, <laughs> just like uh, interviews of people who were talking about Jackie Chan and how great he was. And it was like slightly racist in some ways because a lot of these clips were from the nineties and they're talking about Jackie Chan in a way that was a little bit not sensitive, but it was kind of funny to see in that way. And, but there were some clips from um, Jackie Chan adventures, which was the animated series on um, I think the WB, which I grew up watching. That was the definitive Jackie Chan title for me for a very long time um so i really appreciate them showing that on um during the previewing i remember that show um okay what else did you see this week i also saw miss bala which i talked about on a previous episode i think on friday um this was a a very disappointing film for me uh stars gina rodriguez in sort of her um meant intended sort of action heroine debut um and it's a remake of a 2011 mexican crime drama but it is just so completely devoid of politics it, despite its premise of being about a woman who gets kidnapped by this drug cartel and is forced to sort of run and smuggle drugs for them 
and is like is strangely soapy as well in a way that felt very uncomfortable and felt like it didn't quite know what kind of film it wanted to be, whether it wanted to be like a female empowerment film, or whether it wanted to be some sort of B crime movie. And uh, it because of that just strange juxtaposition, I think it was a kind of a big mess, despite Gina Rodriguez being great in it and deserving of a better vehicle than this. Uh, so that was... Um, it's like kind of a disappointing film to see. Uh, and I also watched on Netflix a TV series. I've watched a lot of just subtitles this this week, apparently. Um, this was a this is a, a series called Kingdom. And this is um, a Korean zombie drama set during uh, Joseon period Korea, which is like medieval time period. And um, it stars uh, Bae Duna, who you may recognize from Sense8, as well as The Host and a plethora of other films. I think she was also in Cloud Atlas. And she is um, one of the stars of this sort of um, sprawling ensemble drama about a zombie outbreak that um, starts from this king and gradually spreads through Korea. And like, there's a great combination of political intrigue as well as some really vivid, just like uh, gorgeous horror imagery that I, I absolutely adored. And uh, the same kind of um, really terrifying, uh, like aerobic sort of zombies that you can recall from Change of Busan. So I would say it's um, it's kind of a combination of Game of Thrones meets uh, Train of Busan, which sounds kind of strange, but I really enjoy it so far. I've only watched, I think, the first two episodes and uh it's it's very well done there's definitely a slow build in the first episode where you don't really see the actual outbreak until like the very end but um the way that they build that and the way that the dread sort of starts mounting up is really well done very very cool and that's on netflix you netflix said? cool yes. ben you, you you're always watching old films <laughs> yeah, I uh, I DVR'd a couple of old ones from, off of uh, TCM. Uh, the first is The Great Train Robbery, which is from 1978. It was uh, written and directed by Michael Crichton, the guy who wrote Jurassic Park. It's based on uh, a book that Michael Crichton also wrote. Um, this is one of the few movies that he directed, and this one stars Sean Connery and Donald Sutherland. It's basically a heist thriller it's sort of loosely based on real events, but um, I think he takes some liberties here and there. But it's set in like the late 1850s, and it's about these uh, like sort of London grifters who decide to try to rob a train that seems unrobbable, where there, there's a train that is carrying this shipment of gold, and it has like two huge safes on it, and each safe has four, uh, two keys, so they need to, to steal these four keys throughout London before they can actually attempt this uh, robbery. Um, it's all very exciting and, and uh, you know, the, pr a pretty typical heist thriller. Um, Connery is, is really good as the lead, and Donald Sutherland in particular is like this um, really uh, sort of skeezy... Uh, finger man he's like a he's like a, a locksmith uh like a pickpocket kind of guy um he stood out to me in, in particular but uh yeah i think this movie is I, I would say it's worth checking out um especially because at the end of the movie and this isn't really giving too much away but uh, if, during the great train robbery there is an action scene on top of the train where connery is trying to uh traverse from one end of the train to another and uh i was i was reading about it and like watching the movie it feels dangerous it feels like you know the like a tom cruise stunt in a mission impossible movie um but you know this like i said the movie came out in the late 70s so i was like what how did they film this what because this looks very real and it turns out that he actually did most of his own stunts including that uh, scene on the top of the train and uh, look you know reading into it looking into it a little bit it it seems like they told him that the train was only going to, be going to be going 20 miles an hour, but it actually ended up going more like 40 or 50 miles an hour. And there were <laughs> several moments in this thing where if Connery didn't just lower his head as they went through a bridge, he would have been decapitated. Like this movie feels dangerous during that extended action scene. So uh, if for nothing else, I, I would recommend checking out the great train robbery there. I think uh, you can rent it on Amazon right now if you're interested in that. And then uh, the only other wait, thing wait, that I did, did they oh, re yeah. did they remake this film a couple years ago? Oh, did they? I Am don't I know. Wrong? Uh, I, uh, I could are be you wrong. thinking of uh, 
you thinking of Unstoppable, the Chris Pine, Denzel Washington movie? No, there <laughs> is a movie I can think of. there's a movie called The Great Train Robbery in 2013, directed by Julian Gerald and James Strong. I don't know if it's based on that. Okay, anyway, maybe, maybe it's a TV series or something. I don't know. Uh, um, 180 minutes. Um, but anyways, you, I am adding this to. to I'm adding. The movie you mentioned to my to my watch watch, uh, watch list because this is uh, something I have missed and it's I, I know a lot of people love this film so I want to check this out. Uh, what yeah, else have you been watching? It's fun and the Creighton element's interesting. Um, the only other thing because I've been at Sundance that I had a chance to watch was a an Alfred Hitchcock movie called Stage Fright, which I'd never seen before. It came out in 1950. Uh, it stars Jane Wyman, Marlene Dietrich, and uh, Michael Wildling. Um, and this one is not one of my favorite Hitchcock movies. I think uh, it's my first Jane Weinman movie, and I thought she did a, a pretty good job in it. Uh, Alistair Sim plays her father, and, and that, I think he is, like, my favorite part of the movie, really. Um, but the film is about this woman who is, like, an aspiring actress, and her crush comes in, and he has gotten himself into some trouble. So she tries to, this, this aspiring actress tries to do whatever she can to sort of clear his name. Uh, and and it, her crush has sort of gotten in the in the clutches of this femme fatale kind of character. Uh, and that's Marlena Dietrich. And uh, the movie, I don't know, it gets a little too twisty for its own good at certain points. There, there are parts where it, it sort of becomes confusing what the hell is going on in the middle of it. Like I'm, I wasn't, I, I was watching this on my couch, but I wasn't, looking at my phone or distracted in any way. And several times I had to just like pause the movie and be like, wait, what is happening? What's going on? <laughs> and I don't know whether that was uh, a fault with the script or what, what exactly was going on there. But um, it's, uh, it's decent. Uh, the movie sort of, you know, it, it, it grinds to a halt a couple times to do some, to let uh, Marlene and Dietrich do some like song and dance numbers that I feel like easily could have been cut out of the film. Um, but uh, you know, if you're like a Hitchcock completist, uh, yeah, maybe check it out. It's available uh, for rent on iTunes and YouTube and Google play right now. And that's called stage fright. Very cool. And Brad, you finally caught up with the fire festival documentaries that we talked about a couple weeks back. Uh, what did you think? I did. Uh, it's fascinating, hilarious, upsetting, uh, <laughs> just just all these different things. Uh, I I found myself laughing at just how ludicrous it was. Like the people bought into this, how despicable Billy McFarland is for being such a piece of garbage hustler. How ridiculous it is that he's still living in these upscale penthouses, and just how hard people tried to like pull this off, like for for no credit whatsoever for this all to fail um i think each documentary has uh you know it's it's highs and lows you know the the hulu one is a little bit more fun uh using various clips from movies and tv shows but then there's some really good stuff in the in the netflix one as, as well I, I think really you just both need to be watched for for different reasons just so you can get like a full picture of what really happened because while there is some overlap there are some areas that uh are covered more extensively in in each doc so yeah, it's I I was laughing just in disbelief and just uh, yeah, it it really is just this fascinating look at just one of the the silliest things that that people have ever bought into. I I don't want to sidetrack this conversation, but since watching these documentaries, I keep on thinking back to I think there's a part in the Netflix documentary late into it where Billy McFarland uh, he invites a camera crew to come to his penthouse. And he he's having them videotape him as he's basically conning people out of money for tickets that they're never going to get. And I keep on thinking back to this, like, what what was his plan? Like, why did he want people taping him doing that? Does anybody know? Because I'm, I'm I, very confused. I feel like that footage was probably intended to be a part of something that, like, maybe showed, his, like, his return and, like, some, something that he was doing that maybe – could have become another viable business, but then it ended up being used just to show that he's scamming people. I imagine whoever shot that footage, maybe after he like got sent to prison or something like that, like they realized that they weren't, it wasn't going to be used for its intended purpose. So they, it, it just got released and used in another form. I, I'm not sure, but yeah. But they said that he couldn't get access to any of the, like there's not tickets to the Met Gala. So how, I, I don't know. I don't even understand how that could be a business because there's no possible way he could, he could sell that to people. 
I don't know. Okay. I, I, I know. I, I apologize for, for, for getting us off track, but that's been something I've been thinking of about because uh, not that Billy seems like a smart guy, but that seems so ill-advised. Like, it seems like everything else he was doing, he was uh, a bit smarter about, and that seems like just so horribly executed like so, so like I, I don't i can't think of a possible real reason for him to do that but uh you also watched the wife i did uh i uh, when i traveled back from from utah i watched the wife on my flight uh glenn close has got had gotten a lot of buzz for her performance in the film uh receiving several awards nominations and so i wanted to check it out uh and it's it's a really good movie and, and glenn close is fantastic and it it is a, a master class uh, in subtle acting, especially when it comes to scenes where she only displays emotion just through various facial expressions. Um, and it really is just, it's, uh, it's definitely a story that is perfect for this time. Uh, as you know, plenty of women in the industry start to, uh, not take a back seat to men have, that have been getting all the credit. And it really makes you wonder just how many stories there are like this, where, you know, a woman who had talent of her own was sidelined in favor of, you know, uh, a, a man who was likely far less talented and received, you know, h- help and assistance from their much more talented to better half. Um, it's yeah, it's 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 a fantastic movie, and Glenn Close's uh, nominations are definitely deserved. Well, very cool, and you can see that uh, in theaters, I guess. I'm not sure if it's still in theaters or if it's still. I I, I think it's like in that weird limbo because I'm not even sure if it's out on VOD yet or anything. Yeah. Okay, um, you'll you'll eventually be able to see it on VOD. Uh, let's move on to what we've been eating. Uh, I'll give you an update on my diet progress. I lost three pounds this week, and it officially put me over the top of uh, crossing the forty pounds loss milestone. So I am excited about that. Uh, all last week, I was craving Chinese food, and I tried to make uh, this keto orange beef and cauliflower fried rice, and I totally screwed it up horribly and it did not did not fill my cravings whatsoever even though i've had it before and it 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 can be great if it was made correctly uh so sunday i was really thinking about eating chinese food i i decided to put it on twitter put a poll on twitter and see if what people the people thought i should do should i should i cheat on my diet or should i stay firm um i think like 1,500 people voted on this poll, and it was 55%. So it was pretty close. 55% said I should cheat, uh, should uh, give myself a cheat meal. Uh, so I did. I ordered uh, Chinese food. I had some orange chicken and some uh, white rice with, with um, soy sauce, and that was all I ate yesterday. I only ate one meal, and, um, and uh, I want to say like 15 minutes. I, I enjoyed it, but 15 minutes after it, I regretted it not in – um, so much as like, uh, I, I was having second thoughts about my decision, but I just felt gross. So I, I, I think you need those cheat meals every once in a while to, to kind of tell yourself that again, like your body tells yourself like, Oh, this isn't what I need. Um, and, uh, I think I've also decided, um, I kind of had this cheat meal approach. I think when you're on a diet, you need to have an approach to cheat meals. You can't just decide if you're going to have a cheat meal at any moment because that can cause that to happen more often. You need to plan for it. And I had planned like these dates that like, you know, like uh, on Christmas and New Year's, but there's not anything like that coming up. So I think I've revisited my cheat meal approach to, I, I talked last week about this app called Happy Scale that I'm using. And one of the cool things with this app is it breaks down your weight loss into these uh, these milestones, which are like, uh, these smaller goals for me, it's like every 10 pounds. So I think what I'm going to do is anytime I hit a milestone, I can have one cheat meal. So that's probably every like month, month and a half, two months, something like that. Um, although some people are saying that I shouldn't reward myself for losing weight with a, with bad food. Uh, Jacob, how, how are you dealing with this? Well, for my first year, I am only doing three cheat weekends, which is going to be my wife's birthday weekend in April, my birthday weekend in August, and then Christmas in December. So every four months or so, 
his work is I, I'm just trying to, for my first year at least, take this as seriously as possible and maybe increase the frequency later on. And Peter, um, the thing I would tell you is don't take unsolicited diet advice from people ever. Uh, I, I know I know you'll be very open about your keto on yeah. Twitter and, and here, and that's really great. I know it's, it's people have written to us and posted comments saying how much it's inspired them, how much they like hearing it, how much it keeps them, you know, going. But the reason why I was cautious to talk about this at all is because all you'll get is a hundred diverging opinions on what you should and shouldn't do. And the truth is you got to do what works for you and you, you should treat your cheat meals in the way that you think works for you. Yeah. And if somebody, if somebody says don't reward yourself with, with cheat meals, I personally think that's bullshit for me because I know what works for me and you know, your body in a way that they do not. So that that's, that's my opinion is, talk to your doctor if you want to talk to anybody yeah. don't listen to anybody who tells you anything about dieting on the internet yeah no, I, I i think you're right and i think they're just t- talking psychologically you're like rewarding yourself with a bad meal and i uh, i don't know I, I don't really think i that matters much to me like it's not like i covet a bad meal i do think it is i don't know <laughs> i'm not going to tweet at anybody that says they're on a diet but i do think it is important to not just willy-nilly decide you're going to have a cheat meal or not like I did this weekend. <laughs> so yeah, I, agree, uh, I agree on that. I think, like I said, uh, uh, having a plan is important, but it has to be your plan. You can't, you can't just let people dictate how you feel. Yeah. Um, anyways, I'm back on diet. I'm in, I, I've lost the weight that I gained from that meal, probably because I only had one meal that day and I'm completely fat adapted on keto. Like, I, I'm like, they have these like pee sticks that you pee onto the stick and it changes the color kind of like, I guess, if you were pregnant or not, um, it tells you how far you're into keto and it's not that reliable, whatever. But, uh, once you become completely fat adapted, those pea sticks don't work anymore. So, um, so I'm completely fat adapted, which means, um, I don't know what it means actually. I guess my body is completely working off fat instead of carbs. So that's kind of cool. Um, Jacob, uh, how has the struggle been for you? The thing about the, the keto diet, and once again, this is not a solicitation for anybody to tell me their opinions on keto. Don't keep it to yourself. Um, <laughs> By the way, we've gotten I... a lot of emails from <laughs> listeners of this podcast that have been very positive, and I think we've only gotten one of those bad emails. So I, I really appreciate our listeners. They they are the best. Yes. Uh, Most I want to <laughs> <laughs> I want to evangelize a product you recommended to me, Peter, because – thing about keto is that once I realized how many products are out there to support the diet, I, I'm a month, I'm about a month in as of the day, and I have not been miserable. Mostly, usually on diets, I am miserable. I get grumpy. I get emotional. I want food constantly. And on this diet, I haven't been that. I mean, I have cravings, and I have you know bad moments, but I never have bad days, which is a big change for me. But you recommend a thing called, a brand called Choco Right, which are these extreme low sugar, extreme low carb treats that taste accurate enough to actual candy once you adjust it to the diet and once you haven't had real candy in a month. So Choco Right is that they're a little bit expensive, you know, compared to, you know, regular candy, but they really do hit the spot. And also last week or week before, I recommended uh, Strive, a cake mix called Strive, which is a, Strive makes a lot of uh, keto-friendly sugars and other products, or sugar substitute, I should say. And I've been eating the Strive uh, chocolate cupcakes, which were very good. But we tried the uh, Strive Vanilla Cupcakes recently, and they are exceptional. Like I, They are so much better than the chocolate ones that I don't want to have the chocolate ones ever again. They are very delicious. So Chocolate Right and Strive are both keeping me going. They're both really, really excellent on top of the other things that I'm doing. What, like I'm also, what, what uh, Chocolate Right do you like? Because uh, uh, The one you recommended, the crispy caramel ones, the only ones I've tried so far. Yeah, that, that one I think is the best. I, I would actually argue, Jacob, that... We could give this to Brad, and Brad would say this tastes like something that he could find, you know, on the shelf at a Seven Eleven, like that is not a diet store candy. I don't know because I, 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 my, my, my gut reaction right now is yeah, I bet it does taste as good, but I also feel like I'm. I'm not saying um, it's a great one of those, but I feel like yeah. he could buy it as like, oh yeah, this would be on the shelf. Uh, but also speaking of things that taste good unexpectedly, uh, I've been getting into coffee. I've been, I've been drinking. Ice black unsweetened Starbucks coffee mixed with a chocolate keto powder uh, mixed with ma- uh, macadamia milk. And I think it's like half a carb for the servings that I'm doing. And normally I'd, uh, 
I've been forcing down keto powders or diet powders in the past, and they haven't worked for me because mixing that stuff with water tends to be really grotesque. But mixing it with coffee, mixing it with, with which normally I don't drink coffee, and mixing it with macadamia milk, which has zero carbs, ends up tasting very satisfying. It tastes um, like some kind of uh, chocolate drink with a nice coffee aftertaste, and I'm finding it incredibly pleasant. I find myself having a lot more energy, both from the coffee and from the uh, keto powder, and uh, so it's another case where, like, if you're on a diet and you're feeling lethargic, because I know people, especially in the early weeks of keto, have things called the keto flu, where they feel very tired and sick. Uh, actually drinking a keto powder, there are many kinds out there. I recommend finding one that works for you. Uh, with some coffee, with the right creamer or or right type of macadamia milk, as I'm using, uh, is actually a really good way to get your energy back and feel energetic on a diet where you're not having, you know, carbs. You're, you're getting a lot of protein and fat, but no carbs. So this is a combination that really has restored my vitality and got me like awake in the mornings or and ready to face my days. See, I don't I don't drink coffee. Uh, I feel like I would need to have a good amount of sweetener in there to to enjoy a coffee. But a lot of people on keto do a thing called bulletproof coffee. Have you tried this? I have not, but I know it's very popular down here in Austin. Yeah, it's uh, basically you put like butter. Like a lot of butter and coffee, um, and it helps uh, get to your fat macro. Um, but a lot of people, actually, even a lot of like uh, athletes, like people like you know in the, that were in the Super Bowl and stuff, I think are like big fans of this whole bulletproof coffee movement. Um, Brad, uh, on the other side of things, we're all healthy and and, and shit. Uh, what are you? What have you been eating? Well, you guys have been enjoying your uh, fake chocolate or whatever, whatever <laughs> that is. <laughs> Um, I got my hands on some real chocolate. Uh, Twix released a new uh, version of their traditional candy bar that's just a triple chocolate Twix, which is just as delicious as you imagine it would be. Um, it's I found it at a gas station when I was in, in Utah. It should be around uh, you know, all the various stores and whatnot. Um, and yeah, it's very good. Twix is actually my favorite candy bar, so I, I, I like when they mix it up and do something new because they don't do it very often. It's pretty much the, the regular Twix. Uh, or the peanut butter Twix. More recently, they have the white chocolate Twix has been around for a little while. But I do wish that they would start mixing it up a little bit more the way the other candy bars do. Because there was there was a, a time when I was a kid where there was there was a cookies and cream Twix, and it was like my favorite candy bar as a kid. And it was the hardest thing to find. And I always looked for it when I was at gas stations. And now it's just not even a thing anymore. So I, I hope that they bring it back at some point. Brad, you're killing me because peanut butter Twix is my favorite candy, and I haven't had one in over in a month now. And man, I, I really, really miss Twix. That's the one candy I really miss. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Jacob. <laughs> um, and that's and then uh, back on the uh, the old cereal grind. Uh, there's a couple new uh, iterations of Captain Crunch that is out on shelves. Uh, in honor of Valentine's Day, they released a chocolatey berry crunch. Which is meant to be kind of like this, uh, like a, basically like a chocolate-covered strawberry sort of cereal, um, and it's pretty good. Although I, I feel like it's lacking a little bit in the chocolate flavor. I, I was hoping that the chocolate crunch pieces were would, would be more like uh, have the, the strength of cocoa puffs chocolate flavor, but it's not quite uh, as strong as the 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 berries flavor, which pretty much tastes like regular uh, crunch berries rather than anything that resembles uh, like a chocolate covered strawberry, but it's, it's still pretty good. And then uh, there's also a strawberry shortcake crunch, uh, which ki- kind of goes for a similar effect, except instead of the chocolate pieces, it has these different, um, they're kind of like crunch pieces, but they're round and it doesn't taste too much like strawberry shortcake. It tastes the, the strawberry flavor is again, more strong. Um, and it, it's not too dissimilar from the regular crunch berries that come if you just get the regular Captain Crunch berries, um, but it does have a faint strawberry flavor to it. It's, it's not uh, as good as the chocolatey berry crunch, but it's it's not bad either. But uh, given the choice, I think I would still just go with the regular crunch berries or the Oops All Berries, which is my personal favorite. Um, so yeah, the chocolatey berry crunch is in stores, and the strawberry shortcake crunch is as well. But if you want the strawberry shortcake one. For some reason, it's only available in those big Malto meal uh, size bags. They didn't release it in as a regular cereal box cereal for some reason. So I'm not sure why. So you got to invest all. You got to be all in for the. Uh... Yeah, you, you got to go for it, or find some friends who also want to try it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, let's talk about what we've been playing. Uh, when I was at the the at the theater seeing 
Battle Angel. I was about to leave and I was with a friend who was there with me to see the movie screening. We were walking out of the the Century City Mall, um, the Westfield Century City Mall, and there was a new thing there called Dreamscape in- Immersive. So we decided to like just walk in and see what it is. And this is another room scale VR company, kind of like The Void, which we've talked about in the past on the podcast. This is co-founded by Walter Parks. Uh, he's a film producer whose credits include the Men in Black series, Minority Report. He helped establish DreamWorks as the head of the motion pictures division. And uh, this company has investors, big names like IMAX and Steven Spielberg. So uh, I was curious about this. Uh, they offer experience, like three different experiences right now. Uh, all of them are unique to uh, this company. I tr- uh, There was one boarding right then, and my friend was like, do you want to do it? It'll only take 20 minutes. And I was like, uh, sure. Uh, and each of these experiences cost like $20. The one that we tried is called Alien Zoo. And the concept of this experience is that you are traveling into outer space to visit a zoo filled with alien species and explore this alien world. Uh, Imagine a trip to explore Jurassic Park meets Pandora, basically. Um, And they offer... uh, And um, So I guess the question is, how does this experience compare to The Void? Uh, The Void setup is more of like a maze of walls and you're like walking through rooms that you can kind of feel the walls and stuff like that. This is... Like the room that this was set up in is like a 20 foot by 20 foot uh, square room. Uh, and it has a small section with a railing and stuff, but it, it, it feels kind of completely empty and open. And, uh, before you put on your VR goggles, uh, in, in the void, it has tracking that it actually sees your hands, but it doesn't see your feet and stuff. They actually put like these sensors on your feet and hands. So when you're in the world of the VR, you, your hands are completely tracked in real time. Your feet are tracked in real time. Like you can look down at your body and like do like crane kicks and whatever you want to do. And you see like your body react in in the CG world, which is kind of interesting. Um, this is... Uh, this experience that in particular was much more of a passive experience. It was like we were on this like little moving platform that was taking us through this alien world. And uh, I think the void, you're more kind of in control of yourself. You're moving from room to room yourself. So you feel like in control of your actions. Uh, there were some cool interactive elements, for instance, uh, there was a point when an alien creature, alien creatures come up in the field to come see you. And, you can actually go and pet the alien creatures. Like they're almost like these alien horse type things and you can actually pet them and you can feel the alien creature there. And I, I, I just assume that the people that are running this have like these, like, like these heads of the alien creatures and they're like tracked in VR space and they come up to you and you can feel them as they're moving it around. But it's, it's kind of crazy and it feels like you're really touching an alien creature. And there, there's a point where you go into this dark cave and you got to pull out these flashlights and to, to light the way, which is kind of cool. I haven't experienced anything like that. Um, but, but, um, and there was also a part where, like, there was these tree frog creatures, and you got to, like, play with them by throwing an, an actual ball, and they would chase after it and stuff like that. Um, it's more of a passive experience, but uh, not to say it's any less immersive. I touched alien creatures. They sneezed on me. I got wet. Uh, uh, while uh, we were rocketing into space, I felt the shake. I felt the wind and mist from the waterfalls. Um it was fun and ended with this cheesy message about uh, Earth's environment. Uh, while The Void feels more like a blockbuster movie, I think uh, Dreamscape in, uh, Immersive feels more like a class field trip to the IMAX theater to watch one of those cool space 3D documentaries, if that makes any sense. Uh, th- there's uh, definitely something to these room scale VR experiences, and I'm, I'm loving them. I'm not completely sure that this one's going to be able to compete in a world where the void lets you explore the worlds of star Wars, Marvel and Disney. But, uh, if you are in anywhere in Los Angeles, you can check that out at, uh, Westfield, um, Westfield century city mall. That is dreamscape interactive. Uh, Jacob, what have you been up to? Uh, first of all, I beat the resident evil two remake. I bought for Xbox one and, Looks great on a 4K TV with HDR system if you have that set up. 
And this is the gold standard for video game remakes. I know remasters and releases are very common these days, and usually they clean up the games a little bit. But Resident Evil 2 is a top-to-bottom, full-on remake of the 1998 game that takes the basic story, basic structure, basic puzzles, and all that of the original game, but completely overhauls it. New camera system, new, new controls, new graphics, new voiceovers, just a complete top-to-bottom uh, remake that takes what made the old game so good 21 years ago, but modernizes it in a way where it's incredibly playable and keeps what works and fixes everything else that didn't or didn't age well. And it's only an eight-hour game, but there's something really, really satisfying about being able to play a game in eight hours. I mean, I have so many... I'm bottlenecked on so many 100-hour games like Red Dead and Zelda that it's like to be able to play a game that, that, that is satisfying and complete in eight to ten hours is so nice. It's such a great feeling, especially since this game invites replayability because there's multiple playable characters. You unlock more stuff when you play. You unlock more modes that make it harder on a second time through. And I just had a great time with this. It's, it's a great game. And the Resident Evil franchise has been had its ups and downs in video games. And Resident Evil 2 feels like a sweet spot where it's perfectly balanced between action, horror, puzzle-solving, exploration. I mean, if you're on the fence about this game, it is, it is one of the best and most satisfying video games I've played in a long time. I, I, I'm looking forward to playing it again, and I just beat it. I beat it in three sittings, uh, and I'm looking forward to sitting down again. That's how much I liked it. Uh, on the table, I played Strata, a game that I've played before, uh, but I've never talked about on the show. Uh, and I broke up the expansion for the first time. It's normally a four-player game. The expansion adds uh, five- and six-player options. And this game has a really hilariously mundane theme where you're building a stained glass window out of dice. And your window always changes based on the card you slip in there. And there are public options for scoring. Like, there's many ways for um, for everyone at the table to score points. It's all public view, and those change every game, randomized. And you have a private scoring option to help that tells you to try to build your window in this way to get points just for yourself. And it's all, all a game about, you know, looking at dice that are rolled. These very beautiful, colorful dice. And placing them in the right spot on your board. Trying to build the right pattern. Trying to make the right choices. And... There's very little luck in the game. It's very much the dice are rolled. You look at your options, and you make the best choices. So sometimes it means you are forced with a bad choice. Sometimes it means making the best of a bad choice. And it's a game of really, really good decisions. And it's a really, really terrific one of those, like, you know, simple 30 to 45 minute, everybody learns in five minutes type games. It maybe looks tricky at first because there are, you know, a number of moving pieces. And it's a Euro game, meaning that it's very much designed to be to be looked at in many different languages and understood immediately. But once you understand what everything means, it's so easy to follow and a lot of fun. And actually, one of two stained glass themed games I've played in recent weeks, both were very, very good. That means Azul, Stained Glass of Sintra, and now this. Both are very, very good games about making tough choices about building stained glass windows. And I recommend them both. HT, I know everybody just wants to hear about... Kingdom Hearts, because you you yes. have been talking about this for months. You've been excited for Kingdom Hearts three. Uh, you, you have you gotten your hands on it? Oh, I've been excited about this for more than months. I've been excited for this for thirteen years. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I got my hands on it. I bought the um, the PS4 bundle, which offers the three game, all three games, plus like some of the. Um, remastered off console games and i've only been playing kingdom hearts 3 on it so far but i plan to at some point revisit the um the other games at some point and um yeah this is a game i've been looking forward to for a long time this like i kind of grew up with kingdom hearts it was released the first one was released in 2002 and uh i'm gonna show my age again i was in elementary school (laughs) and um I was absolutely enamored with this game. It, you know, has all my favorite Disney elements, but it also combined this with a unique sort of Final Fantasy anime style storytelling, which kind of had a a little wistful, melancholy uh, tone to it. A lot of the... um, the first game was surprisingly dark and emotional, and that was something that I wasn't used to feeling at 12 years old. Um, so I was hooked from the beginning by this game, and um, it's it's just so fun to revisit it. It's honestly kind of like coming home again. And um, I have been playing this for the past week since it came out on Tuesday. And then you might have noticed if you follow me on Twitter that I've been tweeting about nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I um, absolutely am 
just uh, so thrilled to be playing Kingdom Hearts 3, and I'm enjoying it immensely. I'm about 12 hours in because I had to like do a little work last week, didn't get to play the entire time, but I just played all weekend. Despite what it sounded like before when I was talking about doing other things, I really wasn't. I was just playing Kingdom Hearts 3. Um, and uh, I I think this, this game kind of started off a little rough because it drops you right in the middle of this... <laughs> the the convoluted storyline that I was talking about before, and it kind of expects you to pick up exactly where the previous game, which was Dream Drop Distance, and I think was on Nintendo 3DS. So a lot of people hadn't played this game, and it kind of picks up directly from that storyline, and uh, doesn't give you much of um, of an introduction to what is going on, but. Um, as you play it, and you kind of get used to the controls again, which are incredibly smooth and uh, like. Uh, really intuitive like it's that it's, just, it's a classic hack and slash and it has the exact same controls they've had for the past like five uh nine games or whatever so it's it's very easy to just like fa- fall back into that um but i think it finally like the game finally kind of comes together once you hit the new pixar and disney worlds that hadn't yet been uh introduced in the previous game so it was for me when we go to the toy story world and uh, you are a, a toy. And there's a really fun meta way of introducing Sora and uh, Donald and Goofy into this world in that Rex is obsessed with this like video game that's kind of Final Fantasy-esque. And he thinks that Sora is an action figure of a character from that video game. He's like, you're a video game character. And Sora's like, oh, I guess I'm a video game character. And it's really <laughs> fun. And um, the the storyline in, in Toy Story actually fits really well with like the Kingdom Hearts storyline too. Like, I was as I was playing it, I was like, wow, this would actually make for a good Toy Story just movie in general or like a, a little short film just because it fits so well with like the themes of friendship and everything and the characterization is just so on point. So I really enjoyed that. I've played through, I think, like Toy Story, Hercules, um, Tangled and Monsters, Inc. And that's been really fun. And um, I'm really liking a lot of the side quests, too. Um, the... Uh, there is something that I've actually just learned is something that um, is common in the Disney parks because I don't know anything about Disney parks, but there's a side quest in which you have to find all these things called lucky emblems and take a picture with them. And these lucky emblems are shaped like Mickey Mouse um, icons. And I hear that's hidden. That's like the hidden Mickeys in the Disney parks. That's something I didn't know, but I'm really enjoying that because it helps. It lets you just kind of explore the world, which is so rich and amazingly rendered in this game. Like you can really see just the progress that's been happened since it, the, this game came to the PS4. And, um, there are actually a lot more sort of like Disney parks, um, like uh, connections to like one of the sort of combos that you can do is something called the attractions combo. <laughs> so once you um, he- get like a certain drive gauge up, you can um, press like the triangle button and it basically like uh, comes up with some Disney parks attraction that you can use to attack the heartless like the monsters so like you can get on the pirate ship and like use that to attack them attack them and like you can rock back and forth with those or um uh what other ones there's like the the teacup the spinning teacups of course and that's that's been really fun it's made the gameplay a little too easy um i think that like ever since kingdom hearts one was the hardest and it kind of got progressively easier uh which with each one um but i really enjoyed it so far i will say though that there are kind of a few too many cutscenes. at some point it feels like you're just kind of playing an interactive movie than an actual video game but um i'm really liking it so far and i just kind of jones in to go back to it now just hearing your description of this 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 just sounds insane and that, now i'm picturing you climbing an indoor rock wall and there's like a uh you know thought bubble coming out of your head and it's just like a picture of you playing kingdom hearts three at home in the thought bubble like being like i want to be home i want to be home <laughs> it really um, was like that's all i was thinking about during the super bowl party i was like when can i go back and play kingdom hearts and i got back at 11 and i was like can i play kingdom hearts right now or would i just like be up till 3 a.m and i was responsible and i didn't play but that's all i've been thinking about you got to be adult sometime. Okay, yeah. that brings us to the end of today's Slash Film Daily. You can find all of our work at SlashFilm.com. You can find this podcast, Slash Film Daily, published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. 
Uh, we got a nice sh- shout out from uh, Tim Tracker and his wife Jen on their new podcast this this week. Uh, so that was great. We might have some new listeners from that. So I, I welcome all of those people who probably just sat through an hour and a half of us talking about what we've been doing this last week and being like, why did she recommend this? If you're a fan of theme parks like the Disney parks and Universal parks, check out their YouTube channel. It's called The Tim Tracker, and uh, their new podcast is not about theme parks, uh, but the the first episode is about aliens, and it's a fun conversation. They're just uh, a fun group to listen to, and I'm excited that they now are in the podcast world. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, you can uh, send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to us at peter at slash com. Please leave your name, gender, geographic location in case we mention email on the air. And please rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends. Spread the word. And we will see you tomorrow. Hey, hey, Peter. Yes, Jacob? It's water cooler day, so you know what that means. Uh, the, the, the joke book? No, baby. No, come on, Peter. It's, it's not a joke book. It's a gargantuan <laughs> book of insults, offense, and effrontery. By a Louis very a. serious Sathion. book. The, the book of truths. I mean, this book tells the truth about all of us. I open up to the tightwads section. And we're going to learn about how all of you are tightwads now. Like, for example, uh, uh, HT, the only thing she ever gave away was a secret. Ah. Uh, uh. <laughs> And Brad, oh man, that Brad, he throws money around like a man without arms. Oh, that is true. And Chris, <laughs> his pockets always outlast the rest of his suit. <laughs> wow. So, right. so he doesn't put his hands in his pockets? I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> I, I think so. Uh, ben, he'll, he'd give you the sleeve off, out of his vest. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> and Peter, when the brakes of his car give way, he tries to hit something cheap. I, I don't even have a car, Jacob. Okay, because you, your brakes went out, Peter. That's why. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I, I guess that does it for today. <laughs> I don't feel like any of those jokes hit, or any of those insults hit, Jacob. Well, money flows from you like drops of blood. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it took a dark turn. Yeah. Some of these jokes, are, some of these insults are kind of dark. Well, if I if you drank poison, he'd try to get the deposit back on the bottle before passing away. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm just, I'm just ending this. I'm ending it here, Jacob. We, we got to put a stop to this. <laughs>